the Lord, everybody. I know you're feeling at home what we're feeling here because we serve a God that transcends all. Right? Right? Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. What I want to focus on today is be still and know. What do you know about God now that you didn't know on March 15th when you hugged everybody goodbye on a regular Sunday, thought you were going to see him that very next Sunday? What do you know about God now that you didn't know then? I will tell you that we were very strong, Bartlett United Pentecostal Church, we were very strong collectively, right? I mean, I don't think any demon in hell would come anywhere near the perimeters of this, especially coming right off of passing the mantle. We were the force. But what we're finding out now is that God is calling us to be strong individually. Not that we weren't strong before, but we have had to press more to strengthen our muscles because what I learned, and I considered myself a pretty committed prayer person, I learned that I was leaning on pastor's prayer more than I thought I would. I learned that I would walk into the service and feel that spirit lift, although I had prayed before service, that immediately I could move into the throne room. Well, guess what? I have to work harder now. <laughs> and I drew strength from each of you. And I'm learning to know God in a different way because my orange self, you know, I've gone through serious withdrawal. I can't bop around and hug everybody. I can't. I mean, even coming here today, I'm sitting in the parking lot because I was supposed to come in at 10 2, and I'm going, okay, I'm going to get to be around some people. And the Lord has had to take me and flip me upside down and say, I want you to know me in the stillness. That's a very common analogy, but the thing that comes to mind is a cocoon. I believe as a church that we have already been taught and trained and prepared for such a time as this. And each of you has had different abilities and qualities that pastor has taught and trained and instilled in you and given you opportunities like the take five or Sister Tamika has said more than once that the things that Sister Betcher has stretched her to do since she's come to Bartlett. And now we're in our finest hour because now it's like, it's almost time. It's almost time. You've been equipped. Now you need to go into your private cocoon because I have some colors and I have some strengths and I have some abilities that I want to add to your unique wingspan. And so I want to challenge you to be careful not to circumvent the process. Be careful not to circumvent the aloneness that God is trying to bring to you. And we're already to see, we're already starting to see some of the beautiful colors and the special gifts that were there all along that are now coming to fruition. Sister Sylvia told me when she came out of that, of all that whole thing with the coronavirus, she said, I can pray for anyone anywhere that has this disease because I have the authority over it. Sister Melody taught us just yesterday or day before about triumphant praise. And oh, how I love to hear Sister Stokes praying on the Zoom prayer because I, her, her spirit of intercession is coming to such strong fruition. Pastor and Sister Bai, man, they have it down. They were the forerunners, I believe, of this online ministry. I've been hearing great things about Hyphen and all that's happening online. But what I want to tell you is that God has a process for each of you. And each of us, it's a unique something different that's adding to. We're not all going to be monarchs and all those other kind of butterflies. But look at how different people in the Bible responded to their cocoons. Paul and Silas praised in the prison. David praised and lamented in his cocoon. That would be me. Hey, everybody. Boo hoo, cry again, and then go back around. Job sinned not with his lips in his cocoon. Moses argued with God in his. Rahab found courage and a savior in hers. Mary willingly stepped into her cocoon to birth the savior. Paul spent three years learning at Gamaliel's feet and then more years in prison in his cocoon. Jacob learned obedience and the reaping of deception in his. And even Jesus of Nazareth spent 30 years in privacy, growing in wisdom before. Before he began this work. Don't fight against what God's trying to do for you. We will be together again, but we are going to be new and stronger and more powerful than you've ever, ever imagined. Embrace all he has 
and we are going to soar to the heavens. God bless. Hallelujah. Praise God. Aren't we having fun? Is anybody having fun? I am. We are experiencing awesome power of God. There we go. Thank you, worship team, bringing the presence of God in. We are delighted you are with us today. If you are online or in the building, <clears throat> we have testimonies after testimonies that are coming in that we are fighting battles in a different way than we have fought them in the past. Uh, yeah, I know it's it's supposed to be in the spirit, but it, there's a there's not just one way to fight in the spirit either. Uh, we've been fighting with incredible authority, and God has given us answers. Um, we are having testimonies coming in of people receiving the Holy Ghost while on FaceTime. People are getting baptized, hearing the preached message, or simply responding to receiving the Holy Ghost, meeting after hours, waiting for one group of people to go out, a group of four or five, so that another group of four or five can come into the church and be baptized. People are receiving the Holy Ghost. Thank God. We are having miracles, signs and wonders that are happening. And we're only limited to 10 people in the church. I think we had probably more miracles when we had 10 people in the church than we did when we had 250 people in the church. So, so thankful for all of you that came to provide our worship in the house of God. It does, it does break the ground and it, and it prepares our hearts to receive. We want to announce that um, we have a winner this week again for quizzing. And this week, it is none other than Chloe Stokes. Now, I forgot to ask, is that Nationals? Oh, no, not yet. Okay, we'll see. Um, we want to uh, also uh, announce nightly devotions at 7 o'clock. There's many people that got a little uh, confused, but the nightly devotions are for everybody. Uh, obviously, if Rhea is meeting on Friday or if uh, Hyphen is meeting on Saturday, they, don't, they can't be in both meetings at 7 o'clock, but the whole church is invited to be in those meetings. One of the family pastors will be uh, ministering uh, a, a devotional inspiration to the church. It only goes for about 15 minutes. We have a time of prayer together, and then we have a time of devotion, and then we close out 15, 20 at the max. But anyways, it's great. Uh, we, we are getting into everybody's homes and teaching mini Bible studies. It's, I think it's wonderful. Have felt the presence of God every night that we gather. Um, Hyphen has been gathering online. They did a series of foundational studies, doctrinal studies, etc. And uh, they did them like every night for seven nights. Thank you, uh, Pastor and Sister Bai, for doing that. Uh, Re, Pastor and Sister Swan, uh, they brought a, a revival, a crusade, so to speak, an online crusade for all, the, all of our youth. I'm telling you, we're, we're probably ministering more now to our people than we were before. And uh, it, we, it, we're just trying harder. We just have to figure out different ways to do it. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for keeping up your financial commitments unto God. God has been good to us. We're not standing on the corner selling pencils. We are able to help so many families. And there are more that we're going to be helping this afternoon. Uh, there are some people that have given money, they've given food, and all that has gone into homes. Uh, one of the people that we delivered it to said, this is going to feed four or five homes because we're going to make dinners and start bringing them to our neighbors, which we've never done before. So we are ministering to all sorts of families through this. So God bless all of you that, that uh, and thank the Lord that, that not many have lost their jobs. Some have got cut back a little bit, but for the most part, People have kept their jobs. <clears throat> so God is good. Even through the worst part of our, our crash, our economy crash, you know, five to eight years ago, 
uh, I think we had one person lose their job and it was temporary and they got it back. So God has been good to this church. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever take it for granted, but say, God, thank you for your help. Thank you for your help. Now, if we could just, before I preach this message this morning, if we could go to the Lord, we have, uh, most of you know, uh, I'm just going to say one of our elders. Uh, he's a, a, in a desperate situation health-wise, and we're asking if the church would come together right now. You know who he is. I just don't want to say his name for, for public reasons. But if we could pray right now and ask God to get into that hospital room, send an angel to that hospital room and save his life right now. Uh, we do need a miracle. To, probably today we need a miracle. So could we pray together right now? Lord, Lord, you know him. Lord, you know who he is and you know what he's struggling with right now. God, we pray that you would reach into his life. We pray that you would walk past the doors and you would walk past the doctors and that you would walk past the nurses. God, that you would move past all of the equipment that is hooked up to him right now and that you would touch those lungs, God. They are struggling, Lord. They are, they are tightening up, God. And their, their ability to bring oxygen to the body and to its organs is being limited right now, Lord. But you are bringing miracles. Right and left, you're bringing miracles. And so, God, we are counting on a miracle today for our elder today. God, we ask you for virtue to flow through our church, through every person <clears throat> that is watching right now. <clears throat> God, that you would let virtue flow through us and to him, we pray. Lord, we have had such powerful prayer meetings for him. And God, the, the lady that's in the hospital as well, God, and, and our other gentleman that's in the hospital, we have su had such powerful prayers. You are answering them, God. Not fast enough for me, but you're answering them. But we pray right now, Jesus, that you would reach not only to our people, God, that are in trouble, but Lord, I've heard as many as 50, 55 people in neighboring churches, God, that are struck down with this, God, and, and few have passed on. God, we pray for these churches and that you would help them. God, let, let their faith be strong. And God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would not let our faith be dwindled because of God, because of your choice to take someone home, Lord. But we pray. For, it's, our, it's our will, God, that, that they live. God, and we pray for that right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, coming against that virus, coming against the damage that it's left. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for the testimonies that keep coming, God. And we pray in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. <clears throat> Amen. Anybody believe God can do a miracle? I do. We've got lots of survivors in our church. And God, it was just amazing. It's like their, their health took an incredible downturn. And all of a sudden, it just stopped and turned around and came back. And it was like, okay, God, let's keep, let's keep that process going. And so we just keep praying, and God does the work. Praise God. Joshua chapter 3, this, this lesson that I'm going to teach today is uh, kind of interesting to me because it started out with a thought, and as I studied it, it turned around into a lesson, and then it, almost a Bible study, but uh, pray that it will give somebody that's listening today some understanding, some, some real spiritual understanding of, of what it is that we do and, and how we do it according to the word. Joshua chapter 3, verse 13. The Bible said, <clears throat> And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon an heap. Notice it says, As soon as as the soles of the feet of the priests. Notice it doesn't say the first one. It says the priests, multiple, that bear the ark when their sole of their feet rest in the waters, then the waters will be cut off that come down from above. I would raise my hand and I would say, man, that sounds good to me. Imagine if you were 
the one that was in front with that rod, with that big rod uh, on your shoulder trying to carry that ark down into the water, you'd want to give up your position temporarily to the guy in the back and say, you know what, I'll, t- I'll pick up the back this time and you just go ahead. But I would say, sounds good to me. Just one minor adjustment, if you don't mind. Could you please just stop the river first and then let me step in? God, I will follow you anywhere. Just stop the river and then I'll get in. Or number two, we could say, why don't you just wait until fall, until it's not so flooded? We can walk across then and not have to worry about all of this faith that's required. So either just stop the river or let's just wait. I'm in, God, but I don't want to do it on your time. I'll do it according to my time. Right now, it looks like the river's too high. It's at flood stage. Let's just wait for about six months. I'll be back. Or thirdly, how about if someone else just went first? You guys go first, and when the river stops, we're good. You guys have all the faith anyways. We have all sorts of answers, don't we? But God didn't give any of those as options. He simply said, start walking, and when your feet rest in the Jordan, the water will stop, and it will roll back. I have a question for everyone today. What are you contemplating with God? What's going through your mind? Well, I was thinking about leading worship. but I don't want everybody looking at me. I was thinking about praying at the altar with somebody, praying them through the Holy Ghost, but I'm a little afraid of what might happen. I was really thinking about getting involved more in the church. My schedule's pretty busy, though, and I really believe that God can do a miracle. I believe God can do a miracle. Just maybe not today. What are you contemplating with God? There are these questions and possible ifs that go through your head every day. You know, I think it's time I step up my prayer. Of course, after church picnic and after and after, and after. You know, I really am ready. I have been coming to this church a long time. I'm ready to consecrate to God. I'm ready to give God everything. I'm ready to just rearrange my life and give God the priorities of my life. I'm ready. Or maybe you said, you know, I think I might be ready to dance. I watch all these other people dance. I saw a YouTube video last night and I'm telling you it was from like 1990 and the preacher turned around and looked at the keyboardist and he said yep and the guy just started to shake and he started to dance and shout I mean he did that kicking up the heels and he was just going all over the place and I said that's what I want <laughs> I want that <sighs> when today I mean, he looked like he was having a good old Holy Ghost hoedown. You all want it. I know you do. Why hasn't it happened? What are you contemplating with God? Maybe drunk in the Holy Ghost? I've seen that happen. I enjoyed watching it happen. I enjoyed watching other people get drunk in the Holy Ghost. I actually got hit with a, with a current of laughing. I was was laughing so hard that day up in Appleton. Are you waiting for someone else to go first? Maybe we're all waiting for somebody else to go first. You know what? Michael, if you step in the water, I'll be right behind you. I'll, I'll be right there. In fact, I'll be six feet behind you because of staying away rules. <laughs> but if you do it, I'll, man, I'll be right there. I'll follow you right into that water. Maybe we're waiting for the river to stop. I'm preaching on the next step. The next step. 
All that priest had to do was step in, carrying that weight, carrying that gold-covered ark, and move down into that water, and his feet squishing through the mud and the little squigglies that are down in that river, and he's walking, as, and then the second batch of guys start go in to the water, and when their feet rested, <coughs> when their feet rested, <clears throat> that's when the river stopped. But their toes were still gushing in that mud. It wasn't like the Red Sea, where God just let the east wind blow and parted the sea and dried up the ground, and then they went across. This was stepping into flowing flood stage water and getting your feet in the mud. <clears throat> he said in that scripture in Joshua chapter 3, he said, the ark is passing over before you. Well, that would be a nice thought. That would be a nice thought if they set the ark on the ground and then the ark got little legs and walked down into the water and began to part everything. That's not what happened. He said, the ark is passing over before you. That was the words that he chose, but not really, because it was born on the shoulders of humanity. You see, humanity carried what represented the presence of God down into the water. They carried. We are being waited on by God to carry what represents the presence of God down into the fast-flowing current and into the mud so that God can do a miracle. <clears throat> Humanity carrying the presence, carrying the word inside the ark was the law. It was the word. It was the Ten Commandments. So he, they were carrying the presence. They were carrying the word they were carrying the mercy seat of God through the river into the promised land. Sounds familiar. Those that bore the ark got their feet wet, but Israel had dry feet. Those that go first should make it easier for those that follow. The priests that went first, because of their sacrifice, they made it easier for the millions of Jews that were to follow behind them. You and I are referred to as royal priesthood. We who already have the mercy of God. Yeah, I'm coming after you today. You that already have the mercy, already have the word. Anybody have Jesus in your heart? The Bible says, and he was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. If you have Jesus in you, you have the word in you. You have mercy. You have the word. You have the blood. You have the law. You have the presence you have it first, but there are people that are waiting to cross the river into the promised land, but they're waiting for you and I to make it easier for them. It's up to us to step into the river and make it stop so that it rolls back so the masses can come and make it across into the promised land. Oh, that's what I said. Wow, God, that was not my lesson, but this is where he took me. If you have the presence and the mercy and the blood, we need to get out in front. Now, it doesn't say how long the priests stood there with the ark. It just says when their feet rested that the water would roll back. But if Israel walked across on dry ground, how long did it take for that to dry up? I don't know. It doesn't say. But they stood there and they waited until it was easy for them to... You know what? Winning souls, trying to reach out for the lost 
is a lot of work. Sometimes it takes a lot of patience. But they stood there, and the Bible says that when Israel walked past them, they walked past them on dry ground. This instance connected to 40 years previous. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2, it says, And all were baptized. This was speaking about the Jews that left Egypt. And they went through the Red Sea, and, and they were following the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. And it says, They were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud, and in the sea, this was a type and foreshadow. The glory of God overshadowed them. And the, 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 the water, it was, a, it was a simulation in a sense. It was a type and foreshadow of them going down beneath the level of the water. It says they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in, in the sea, in the presence and in the water. Now the next generation, the generation that Joshua led, had the same miracle. I never saw this before until, this, until yesterday. Moses led them through and they were on dry ground. But we have, we have Joshua leading them through the river. Had the same miracle. The same miracle of we need to get from here to there and there's water in front of us. And so the water was parted. But at the Red Sea, they didn't carry the ark. They didn't have the ark yet. So all they did was follow Moses across the Red Sea. But when it came to Joshua, they had the ark of the covenant. So they were able to go across the River Jordan with the presence of God. Post-Sinai, they had the plan for the tabernacle. See, God, when Moses went up the mountain, God gave him the plan for the tabernacle. When he came down, that's where he got it from. It wasn't just the Ten Commandments. It was the moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial law that they got from the mountain. But the Old Testament, we find them being led of God. Notice this. Old Testament, the prophets, the, 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 the patriarchs, being led of God... They allowed God to lead them through the journey that God had for them. But in the New Testament, they carried <clears throat> the representation of God with them. Old Testament, they followed God. When Joshua crossed for the second time, we find them carrying the presence of God. Old Testament, God told them what to do and led them. In the New Testament, we receive God inside, so we carry him across the river. We carry him with us across the river. What an incredible analogy. God is saying Old Testament, New Testament, this is the way we did it. It was an outside following, but in the, when Joshua the second time, now it's inside, we carry him with us across the river. We can't be baptized for the dead. Why do I say that? Nor can our parents be baptized for us. Moses and his group had to go through the Red Sea. Why didn't Joshua just say, God, we've already done this once? It's because that generation died off. They were ready to pass over into the promised land. And God said, you know what? You can't go to heaven because of what your dad did. What happened 40 years previous? You have to have your own relationship with passing through the water and following and carrying the presence of God. We can't go to heaven on anybody else's relationship with God. We have to have our own with God. And now we have to carry the presence with us into the promised land. So no baptism for the dead. If so, they would not have had to cross a river again. We will all need to experience the miraculous in our journey. Oh, really? Yes. God brought them out of Egypt's bondage with a miracle. He said, I'm going to show you 10 miracles to get you out of Egypt. I'm going to break you free from sin. I'm going to give you a miracle. And he brought them into the promised land with a miracle. So he got them out of sin with a miracle and got them into the promised land 
with a miracle. Let me tell somebody that's listening this morning that it's going to take a miracle to get you out of Egypt. It's going to take an absolute miracle to get you away from sin, to get you delivered, to get you out of bondage into freedom. It will take a miracle to get you out of Egypt, but it will also take another one to get you into the promised land. Many Christians today Live their life saying, God gave me a miracle and broke me free from sin. Praise God. It's going to take you another miracle to get into heaven. You can't just get out of sin to get into heaven. You've got to be filled with his presence and carry that across the, across the river. I stood on top of Mount Nebo and I saw the river Jordan. This message means so much more to me today because I saw it. I stood up there. I stood where Moses stood and I overlooked the, 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 the rolling hills and goes down to the river Jordan and brother Sham and sister Sham were with us and we could see Jericho and Jerusalem and we could see the Dead Sea and Lake Tiberias. We could see it all there. But when you look at this, it's going to take a miracle to get from there over to the promised land. It's going to take a miracle to stop that Jordan. It was the ark and obedience that cleared the way. It wasn't just having the ark that cleared the way into the promised land. It was obeying God. Well, I don't have to do anything. I have the ark. Oh, you have to pick up the ark and you have to carry it down into the river Jordan. That's obedience, folks. We have to obey whatever God says. Well, I get to go to heaven based upon my good looks and grace. No, that's not what God said. God said, my grace gave you the ark. Now you obey and pick it up and walk across the river. We have to obey. They couldn't get across without the ark. So they had to have the ark. They had to bring it with them, but they also had to carry it down into the water with them to stop the water so the people could pass over. Jordan means descending down. From where it starts in Dan all the way down to the Dead Sea, it descends down. But we look at Jordan. I found out yesterday that Jordan starts one of its starting sources is in Dan. And I find out that the word Dan means judgment. The Jordan River starts at the source of judgment, part of Jordan's source. Rachel said in Genesis chapter 30, God has judged my case and he has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. Because of God's judgment, she said, that's what I'm going to call my son. I'm going to call my son judgment. So the Jordan is an emblem of death and judgment in the Bible. The Jordan starts at judgment and it flows into death. It stops at the Dead Sea. I could see it. You can see it going. It flows from judgment to death. Therefore, judgment flows down into death. This is the judgment of God. The judgment of God will flow down and down and down until it is dead. That's what happens in our sin. When we live a life of sin, the judgment of God will beat us down and down and down until it's dead. He said, you that were dead in trespasses and sins. I hope you hear what I'm talking about today. There is a river Jordan. It is judgment and death, and it stands between you and the promised land. And there's only one way to get across the river. You've got to get the presence and carry it across with obedience. My God, do you feel that? Whew. Obedience and possessing the ark rolled back the Jordan. The Bible says when they stepped in and their feet rested, it rolled back the river Jordan. What's it called? Judgment. It, oh, man, I feel the Holy Ghost, Brother Psalm. It rolled back judgment. All the way, what was the city? Adam. The Bible says it rolled back the water of Jordan all the way to Adam. Whew. 
And being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, speaking of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. He said he found himself and he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus himself became obedient unto death. He said, I will commit myself to the river of death. I will step into the river. I'm going to commit myself and be obedient unto death. That's what Israel was doing, the priesthood. They were being obedient unto death. They were saying, I will obey God and step into the river of judgment that leads to death. God. Jesus was obedient. When Jesus stepped into that river of death, he carried the blood. He carried the presence. He was the bread of life. He was, remember in the ark, he was the word. (laughs) He was the word. He was carrying the word into the river of death. He was the bread of life. There was bread manna that was in the pot of manna that was in the ark. The Spirit of God was in Jesus Christ, so he was carrying the presence. He was carrying the mercy seat of God because he is our mercy seat. He is the lamb that was sacrificed, and all of that went down into that water of death. And when he went into that water, judgment was rolled. Oh, God. It was rolled back all the way to the Garden of Eden, all the way to Adam. When Adam took of that fruit and ate it, God said, I'm going to roll it back all the way to Adam. Talk about this word. If you're not excited about it yet, we need to put the paddles on your heart and give them about 800 watts. You understand? This is the word of God. God is saying, I gave you truth. Wow. Rolled back the flow of death and judgment all the way back to Adam. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Why did he say that? Adam to Moses. Because things were about to change. It reigned, death reigned from Adam to Moses. That means it ain't going to reign anymore. Something is going to happen that will change. It says, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, they had a different sin than Adam. Notice, who is a type of him who was to come. As Adam sinned, Jesus is called the second Adam. He is called. He was a type and foreshadow. He was going to change things. Now, as the Ark of the Covenant passed through the Jordan River, opposite Jericho, so Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan at Beth That's found... Uh, they passed, it's, it's found in Joshua 3, 16 and 17. Beth Abara. Jesus, the, the, in Old Testament, they took the ark down into the water. Jesus went down into the water. Wait a minute. Joshua passed through the River Jordan on dry ground opposite the city of Jericho. Right after that, right after they passed through the water, they came up, they did their memorial, and they went and took Jericho. So they, Jericho was so evil. It had high walls, which tells me that if we do it right and pass through the river correctly, we can have victory over evil. We can have victory over walls, which can represent prison and bondage. Walls in your life can be torn down if we go through the water and we have the presence with us. Notice this. Jesus was baptized at Beth Abara. That means the place of the passage. Jesus was baptized in the very place that they passed across. A type and foreshadow. They didn't call it a place of passage. They called it the place. Beth Abara means the place of the crossing. This is where Joshua 
came down into the water. The priest came down into the water and it stopped and it rolled back. Jesus went into the water right there. He said, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you that I, as the ark of God, carrying the presence of God, the bread, the mercy, the blood, the lamb, I'm going to go down into the water and I'm going to roll back the waters of judgment all the way from this point, all the way up to Adam. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to do it in the person of Jesus Christ. John answered them saying, I indeed baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred, preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. That's found in John chapter 1, verse 26. Jesus was the living ark of God to fulfill the law once contained in the ark. He came to fulfill the law that was contained and carried in the ark. The word became flesh. They carried the ark, which represents the presence of God, through Jordan, which represents judgment and death, into the promised land. The law was in the ark. The law went down into the river where Jesus would be baptized. The law that condemns, the law that brought judgment was carried down into the water. What do you think happens at baptism, folks? What happens is the law that says you are a sinner. You deserve judgment. You deserve hellfire for the rest of eternity. We carry that law with us because we have the word that was made flesh that filled our hearts with his spirit and we walk down into that water of judgment and it gets water. It gets baptized. Jesus was baptized If they carried that ark down into the water, it would allow them to pass through into the promised land. Is it a coincidence that John was baptizing at Bethabara, the place of passage? You are priests carrying the ark, the presence of God, the law in our hearts, manna, the rod that was budded, which is death to life. He took something dead and made it alive. He said, if you have the spirit in you that raised up Christ from the dead, then that spirit that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal body by his spirit which is in you. And 1 Peter 2, 9 says, you are a chosen generation. You are the royal priesthood. So you are chosen. Notice he, he used generation. You got Moses' generation and then those people died in the wilderness. And you have Joshua. And, and Peter uses, you are a chosen generation. This generation. A royal priesthood. He called you a generation. He called you a royal priesthood. Peter, what are you getting at? It's time to get the presence inside, take it down into the water, and, and back up the law all the way to the day you were born, washing away every sin so you can pass through into the promised land. He called you a holy nation, a peculiar people, and everyone says amen. amen. That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out. Talk about calling us out. He called us out of darkness, out of Egypt, into his marvelous light, into the promised land. All of the analogies work. What is God asking of you this morning? All he said was, hey, you priests, you four priests, just take that ark and stand in the water, and the water will back up. Sounds so simple. How many steps? What are you contemplating this morning? Are you contemplating maybe living for God? Are you contemplating telling God that you're sorry for your sins? Repenting. Are you telling him? Are you contemplating maybe getting baptized like the young man was last week? I didn't forget his name. I just didn't want to say it publicly. 
I'll let him do that. What is God asking of you? It's time to take a step, the next step. Their obedience, four men. Think about this. It wasn't far. The Jordan is not very wide. I saw it. I was standing at the edge. It's not very wide. So a few steps, probably six steps, would get you into the middle. It won't take you long to get you to the place where you can be right in the middle of the will of God. Notice their obedience. Just four men carrying the ark down into the Jordan. Their obedience affected millions. Millions. Millions of people were standing there a couple thousand feet back watching what was happening, waiting, waiting for somebody to obey, waiting for somebody to dance, shout, get a prayer life, consecrate to God, get baptized, accept a call from God. Accept the will of God in your life. What is the next step? You have the law. You have provision. You have life. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. What is the next step? We've experienced repentance and baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of sins and the infilling of the Holy Ghost evidence speaking in other tongues. What is the next step? Is it finance? But God, I, I don't know if I can trust you that much. What about holiness? Is God asking you to take a step of holiness? What about separation from the world? Is God putting pressure on you, wooing you, saying, come out from among them and be separate? It's not far. It's only a few steps. What is your next step to experience, like Sister Goff said, more of God? We're in the middle of this calamity, and yet my prayer life has never been better. My experiences with God have never been better. The studies that I've been doing have been deeper, and the prayer has been more authoritative than ever. Relational? Maybe your next step is relate relational. Maybe it's to accept what God wants for your life. Maybe it's to shun what you thought you wanted for your life. What is it? Is it discipleship? Maybe it's teaching others. We have the, I'm about five minutes to go here for the musician's sake. We have a woman with the issue of blood for 12 years. 12 years. Trying, waiting, patiently, exhausting all intelligence and finance to get her answer, and yet still sick, still dying. And yet she made her way to Jesus. But there's one step at the end of all that. One step. When she's standing within an arm's reach of him, violating Governor Pritzker's rules, She's standing just an arm's length away, one step away. How close are you today? How close are you to fulfilling that desire in your heart for more? She was one step away. She just decided. Jesus didn't turn and look at her. Not yet. She had a step. Step a little closer reached and touched the hem of his garment. Twelve years of calamity. Twelve years of pain, of exhaustion and fatigue, disease and doctor's visits. One step. When she touched, Jesus said, who touched me? Somebody took a step of faith right now. I know she took a step of faith getting up out of her house that morning walking her way over to where Jesus was, pressing her way through the crowd. I know those were all steps, 
But there was one step Jesus was waiting for. It was the step that reached out and grabbed the hem of his garment because he said, virtue just flowed out of me. Where is she? Where? There you are. Thy faith hath made thee whole. He said that last step, that last step is what did it. You reached out and you took advantage of what was in front of you. Looking round about them, Luke chapter 6, he said unto the man, stretch forth thy hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored. They were having a debate on this was the Sabbath and you're not supposed to do anything on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, are you going to stop this guy from getting healed on the Sabbath? And they just kind of stared at him. They're like, you're about to break the law. And he said, stretch forth your hand. What are you going to do? If I violate the law, I'm in trouble. But that guy heals people. What am I going to do? He said, stretch forth your hand. The guy said, well, all right. He stretched forth his hand. He took a step. How close are you to a miracle today? Your hand is all withered and leper brought to your... You can't use your hand. And he says, well, why don't you just take a chance? All right. I'm going to take a step right now. As soon as he thrust forth his hand, he said, you're healed. Lastly, the ship was sinking. Storm was heavy. They see a creature coming toward them on the water, walking on the water. And all of a sudden, Peter recognized He said, don't be afraid. And Peter said, Lord, if it's you, please bid me come. Now, I want to remind you for a second that there was another time when Jesus was standing on the shore and he said, here, cast the the nets on the other side. And, And they did and they got lots of fish. But when Peter recognized, he said, it's the Lord. He literally took a some kind of a cloth, put it around him, probably fishing in his shorts, whatever, out there. And he he put it around him, and he jumped. He just cast, the Bible says he cast himself into the water. He cast himself into the water and swam to shore. The other guy stayed in the boat and got the boat to go to shore, but Peter didn't wait. He jumped over the bow of the ship into the water. Now, there are times when you jump, And there are other times when you step. That time he jumped. He dove into the water and swam to shore. This time he said, if it be thou, bid me come. And it says he got out of the boat and walked. He got out of the boat. He got out of the boat and he he didn't jump. Because if the water was hard enough to support him, he'd hurt himself. He's jumping on the hard water. You know what I'm saying? Trying to be a little funny. But when he didn't jump into the water, he stepped out. He took a step. Right now, I don't know if that's going to support me. The second step was easy. After the priest went into the water, the next guy was like, hey, this is fine. We get dry ground. But the first step was... If it, is it really you? <laughs> um, this is a big storm. And he, his foot caught on the top of the water. But it took one step, Brother Sean. One step. The next one was easy. It's like, man, this is going to work. And he started walking to him. But one step. One step. He was one step away from a miracle. While he's hanging on to the boat, that's no miracle. But when he, when his foot hit the water and it caught, now we've got a miracle. One step to a miracle. How close are you? Are you thinking about taking a step this morning? Maybe repenting 
that brings forgiveness. When we tell him we're sorry, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive. Faithful and just to forgive. When we say, Lord, it's my fault. I did it. I'm not blaming anybody else. I did it. It's my fault. I take responsibility, but I need you to forgive me. He said, I forgive you. But the record is still in heaven that you committed that sin. Are you thinking about taking a step of baptism? The Bible says for the remission of sins in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. The original is for the blotting out. The blotting out lifts the ink off the page so there's no longer any sin listed. Baptism comes with a name and it comes with a covenant. Are you thinking about taking the step of receiving the Holy Ghost? The Bible calls it the resurrection power. It's power. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. It comes with gifts, which are tools that are used to navigate the rest of your walk here on earth and to edify the church. That's what the gifts are for. It's not to puff us up with pride. It's to utilize it to edify the church and to navigate your walk with God. Do you need a miracle this morning? I know somebody who does. Our elder is only one step away, one step away from walking out of that hospital. Just one step. What are you contemplating with Jesus this morning? You are so close. You can get on your knees right now and tell him you're sorry, and you can receive the Holy Ghost just like somebody else did a few weeks ago. Live stream, FaceTime, receive the Holy Ghost in a vehicle. You can do it now. If you just close your eyes and begin to worship him, you simply have to tell him you're sorry because you have to have forgiveness to allow him to come close. He can't do that unless you have forgiveness. When he comes close, after you've apologized, now you'll feel him. Your hands may tremble. Your tears may fall. Your lips may become tight. And you stumble upon your syllables as he starts to fill you with the Holy Ghost. If you'll do that today, he will fill you with the Holy Ghost right where you are. It's that simple. You merely start to talk to him. Hallelujah is a good word because it means praise the Lord, but it's above that. It's, it means I am worshiping him with everything in me. When you do that and you cry out hallelujah, all of a sudden your words will become a spiritual language that you didn't learn. That's what the, that's what the scriptures bear it out to be. It simply means something that was naturally a language that was naturally unacquired. You didn't learn this from walking around your house at home, and you didn't learn it from Spanish class at high school. You didn't do that. This is something that was naturally unacquired. You got this spiritually. That's what God wants to do for you right now if you'll begin to worship. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to worship for a few minutes, and we're going to believe that God's going to give you a miracle. Jesus, right now, I pray, there are miracles of healing that are being waited upon right now, but somebody needs to step in the river. Somebody needs to take a step of faith and reach out and touch the hem of his garment to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. That was a step of faith. Somebody needs to cry out where they are right now and say, Lord, I need you. I don't care if the neighbor hears me. I don't care if the person in the condo next to me hears me. I'm going to cry out to God right now, and I'm going to ask him for forgiveness, and he's going to 
to forgive me and then I'm going to reach out for my miracle. I'm going to walk on water if need be, but I'm going to step into my miracle and it, it will lead me closer to Jesus. I promise you it will happen in the name of Jesus. Take away every doubt. Take away every tradition. Take away every ceremony. God, every religion and give somebody some faith that will allow them to lead them closer to you. I declare it in the name of Jesus. I declare against every disease. I declare against every infirmity. The name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the word of God, the spirit of God. Come against everything that is battling against the church. Right now in the name of Jesus, receive ye the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Let's go ahead and worship now. Amen. 
baptize you. That's a little more difficult <laughs> to baptize without touching, but we've got lots of hand sanitizer here. We'll take care of that, but if you want to be baptized in his name, if you have a need, if you want to have a Bible study, please contact our church. The address is on the website. Call us, email us, let us know. We'll be back here again on Wednesday night with another word from the Lord. God bless you. I pray that this has been a blessing to you. Come and see us again, and even more so, when the doors are open to the public again, please come and see us. We will let you know. God bless.